And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, ever returning good brother to the temple, Crid, creator, eh, creator, lord, and master of the Nexus. The, upcom the upcoming board game that is fuel that is motivated by violence and fueled by dice. I almost said <laughs> dialence. Um, maybe you can trademark yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say motivated by dialing in. <laughs> um, no, I was. I, I had I had switched violence and dice in my head, and I created dialence, which um, I'm just yeah. saying. I think you found it, I think you found the nickname for your new dice. Yeah, <laughs> the dialence. Yeah, the one and only. J. Scott Rumps. How are you doing today, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for coming back and brave and braving the hell of time zones. Um, <laughs> um, since the location since the location is Memphis, allowed me to as as a um gr as a bit of a grinder myself. Let me and a bit of a goon. Let me say my sincere condolences for the de for the death of your hockey team. Yeah. Yeah, the River Kings are they river? Are they gone? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> no, I was I was making I was making a joke about the Predators. <laughs> well, that's Nashville's yeah. hockey team. That's 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 well, Nashville. It's, it's still Tennessee. It's still Tennessee. So, so it counts. Far away. <laughs> um, yeah. But I feel like I feel like I jinxed it all those years ago by by speaking highly of Pekka Rene. Yeah. Yeah, we had a um, Jay and I in in our history of creative um, endeavors. We uh, we used to go down um, when when they were still making the playoffs, and um, we used to sell T shirts that said uh, "My Pekka takes up the whole net," <laughs> and uh, on the back it would say "Nobody beats my Pekka." So, oh uh, yeah, well they they're still they're still they end, they ended up making the playoffs, but at, le at least this. This year, although um, this year, of course, was a crap yeah, year, but that doesn't even count. <laughs> I um, I the way they the way they were performing, I feel like I just saw their window close shut. Yeah, no, um, for sure. I know they're going to hang another banner, but I think one banner that they should have just that just says power a power play so offensive that is ba that is banned in several religions and countries. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Peck is an ability to do anything against Pittsburgh. To this day, irks me. Well, you can probably laugh at them because Pitt, because um, because Pittsburgh isn't get, isn't going to be doing much in the next few years. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't. It doesn't look like anybody's going to be doing much in the next few years. The way things um, are going. The th the thing about the thing about hockey that I, and this is, and the reason why I find it such a fascinating sport is. Narratives are extremely fickle. There are some narratives that they'll, they'll maintain, but like if you had told me Dallas would have made the would have made the finals or before before the pandemic, I wouldn't have believed you because they looked absolutely absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. And yet they managed to, they managed to power on through. Um, and and when it came to Tampa Bay, I expected them to choke again, like they've done ev like they've done every year for years, including mm -hmm. that whole thing against getting swept by the Blue Jackets after winning the President's Trophy. Yeah, setting a record, I think, for the most wins in a season. They didn't and set the record; they tied it. They tied it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then got swept in the first round of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember the team that. That's never won a playoff series up to that point. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, hockey hockey can be a little bit like baseball, where it's where it's very streaky. You know, who whoever's hot, you know, when the playoffs uh, come around, uh, tend to benefit. It's such a long it's such a long season. I, I have a hard time following baseball or hockey during the regular season. I usually wait until the uh, until the playoffs to tune in. And with hockey this year, I didn't even realize that it had got underway until um, but, the Stanley Cup. <laughs> look at it. Look at it on the bright side. At the very least, you didn't lose to a forty-year-old Zamboni driver. That's true. 
That is very true. <laughs> nope. I've run that joke into the ground, but that's never going to die down. <laughs> so getting getting off of getting off of the bullshit. Um so ne- so Nexus is a uh, board game that I th- I think you described in the past as basically basically being Almost like the the world's the world's best and worst gladiatorial arena. Yeah, yeah. Depending on what you're looking for, mm-hmm. spectator wise, it's it's the best. Mm-hmm. Um, combatant wise, it's it's probably probably the worst. Um, depending on how the how the dice roll. Yeah. So with that with that in mind, I kind of touched on this the last time you're on, but how? But um. What were the inspirations and what was the sparks when it came to creating this particular style of of um of arena combat for Nexus? So the the biggest thing um the biggest thing we had going in is you you couldn't care what happened to the uh, opponents themselves. The first the first thing Jay and I did was remove the player from the inside of the arena. Mm-hmm. We, we wanted the helots, you know, the fighters in the arena that we call them, to be really expendable. And you really, like, we, we really wanted to drive home the fact that you don't care if this thing lives or dies. The only thing that you really care about is um, the show that it puts on and whether or not it builds your own fame and fortune. Mm-hmm. So the analogy I use all the time is Don King. Um, Don King does not give a shit about what happens to Mike Tyson. He doesn't care if he lives. He doesn't care if he dies. All Don King cares about is Don King and what Mike Tyson can do for Don King's fame and Don King's, uh, finances. Mm -hmm. So, um, by doing that, what we did is we, we came up with the concept of Lannisters, which I had done a little digging. I was trying to find, you know, uh, a, a, a groovy word. (laughs) <laughs> to call them and um lannisters back in the roman times would train and um sometimes own gladiators in gladiatorial events so we were like okay well we're gonna be the lannisters and we're gonna make our helots kill each other um that was key for um a number of reasons one one being that the arena was going to be trying to kill everybody in it as the fight was going on mm-hmm. um and the the way the game ultimately evolved, this version that we have right now on Kickstarter, is the winning mechanic isn't being the last, um, having your fighter be the last one standing. There's a there's a little bonus for that. Um, you you get another bonus if if you can actually kill the other helot instead of just um, basically inca- incapacitating it. Uh, but the ultimate mechanic is the rep coins. And the rep coins are earned throughout the bout by, you know, doing damage to the opponent, uh, entertaining the crowd, gloating, um, different things, different things like that. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the Lannisters are also not the only ones that uh, collect these rep coins throughout the bout. You've also got the crowd itself, which whenever a hazard does damage, uh, whenever certain turning uh, points occur, uh, turning point cards and events occur, uh, cred will start going into the crowd pile. The crowd, uh, the crowd pile will also build up if they're not happy with what you're doing with your helot. So, um, I'm really kind of just diving into all the, (laughs) all the aspects of the game here, but you have, uh, you have your command points that you use on actions and you use on movements throughout the bout. And sometimes it may be advantageous to not use all of the points available to you. And when you don't, the crowd gets frustrated. Um, and they, you start losing cred to the crowd when, when that happens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of where, where, uh, where we started with it with the first thing we did is removed ourselves from the, from the arena and kind of built the game around that. Now the, obviously one of the first things that I had, that I had noticed just from, just from the visual appeal of Nexus is the fact that you've got a lot of dark 
or ev- or even um black humor with it within uh-huh. it. Um yeah. a little a little nineties and a little um in some in some cases a little bit British. Um <laughs> yeah. what what were so, what were what would you say were some of the um some of the materials that kind of provided the inspiration for that um particular style of black humor? Our I mean for Jay and I Growing up in Detroit, I, I don't know if it was a regional thing or what, but I mean, just, just our childhood. I mean, we grew up watching RoboCop um, as 10 year olds. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, what, you know, when I go back and I look at that movie now, I'm like, holy cow. Like, I, I don't know anybody that, that would let their kids, you know, watch stuff like this. And we watched, you know, we watched stuff like that all the time. You were um, one of those sneaking into a, into a theater kind of kids. We, we had it on VHS and we didn't have to sneak. Um, you know, our parents were just like, Hey, you know, kids, kids like it. <laughs> kids like Which, RoboCop. <laughs> I, um, for what, it, for what it's worth, I, um, I remember reading, I remember reading an article not too, um, not too long ago that talked about how that talked about a bit of controversy when, um, alien got a, got a toy line. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and, for what it for what it's worth that whole that whole that whole uh, parental neglect thing, that yeah. is that's that is that was not just a isolated case when it comes to, when it came to generations. Because when I was in high school, I um, <laughs> and I've told I've told this story a few times, but I ha- I was I um worked at a um video store um Hollywood Video, um okay, and one t- one day somebody come some some parent comes up to me and clearly looked like a soccer mom and right <laughs> he hands me a copy of Watership Down and asks is this film appropriate for kids <laughs> <laughs> you know those so, moments yep, where your your where your <laughs> shul- where your shoulder angel is trying to convince is trying to convince you of your morals and to enforce good behavior in you yeah I didn't hear a peep out of that guy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. It wasn't the first time this kind of thing happened because it happened again about about three months beforehand with somebody bringing up Return to Oz, and I was like, <laughs> "I'm not saying anything." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Watership Down. Obviously, I wouldn't put that in front of a kid, but in the case of Return to Oz, you could. But um, both the kids and the parents would be questioning their sanity afterwards. <laughs> um but yeah we we i mean we just we grew up we grew up loving violence like we we robocop um roadhouse like just all that all that stuff was awesome like we we dug it and we liked the um big kind of over the top kind of sci-fi hero stuff um you know he-man and (laughs) and all the things so Mm -hmm. We also, um, you know, the dark humor thing, that's just, that, that's been, that's been a staple for, for Jay and I, and it's probably the reason that, you know, we've been kind of best friends for as long as we have, we, we've probably alienated most of the people that have gotten to know us (laughs) over the years. Eventually we've gone too far and, you know, offended, offended too much. And, you know, we just end up, you know, like, okay, well, whatever. We we've got each other. Um, I can still take a joke. Can you? Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's let's keep doing this then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's you know the the dark humor has just always been always been a part of it for us. Yeah, and for for what it's worth, I um, I've always I look I look at that kind I look at that kind of that kind of dark humor and the and the whole concept of offense and and um. Some um rem- I'm reminded of I'm reminded of um some of something that um Mel Brooks had said a long time ago when it came to describing dark comedy. Mm-hmm. Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. <laughs> Which, yeah, there was. Now, gr- now, granted, th- granted, he was being fa- he was being semi facetious with it, but there is a bit of truth to that. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, if it happens to you, you're so much more sensitive to it. And if it happens to someone else, you have all the leeway in the world to find the humor in the situation. Yeah, like I was, yeah. I had, shared, I had, um, as a case in point, I always, I always get a laugh when I see when I see that the infamous can opener bridge in North Carolina claims another victim. <laughs> Because I, because some people are too are too dumb to realize that yeah it's an eleven foot eight bridge, probably not to drive probably not a good idea to drive your U haul under that. <laughs> yeah, and, but some people do, or they drive a Penske truck under that, and um, there's a reason it's gotten that nickname. <laughs> right, right. Um. Now, when it comes to when it com- when it comes to the um. When it comes to the players within it, given the given that whole detachment, would you say that it's that it's more about each each person coming to the table is akin to a stable manager, since gla- since gladiators is obviously one of the influences here. Yeah, you know when when you're getting into kind of the role play aspect mm-hmm. of it in in the legacy version, um, yeah, you're going to have like you can't use the same helmet twice in a row. Mm-hmm. You have to rest your you have to rest your helots and things like that. You always you always have a trope of of helots, um, and you're using those three. Um, that's you know that's what you got to work with, and you've got to. And, and again, this is more in the legacy a- aspect of it. You've got to decide. Okay, this this helot got really screwed up in this fight, and he lost his arm. Do I want to spend money replacing the arm. Do I want to upgrade it? Do I want to try and mutate it? Maybe grow um, a tentacle or something. Do I want to put in a a cybernetic arm? Um, Or is this helot pretty much spent? Do I want to sell its organic matter and have the gnomes grow me another helot in the meat gardens and and kind of start, start over again. Yeah. Um, And, In the in, now, of course, the when it comes to looking at the um, board, um, one thing that one thing that I find interesting with with how it's set up is using a magnetic frame. Mm-hmm. Um, was that was that just a means to make sure that everything was more organized instead of having that? In a lot of board games, you have player areas, but it's more of a suggestion than an actual yeah. hard and fast thing. So the the original the original concept of the frame in in I guess that we'll we'll call it the first edition of Nexus mm-hmm. was um, something to be aesthetically pleasing and to um, kind of hold the cards and keep things keep things off the table and, and really to kind of make it um, stand out a, a little bit from from everything else. Mm-hmm. I think the very the very first thing we looked at in the very first iteration of the game, we had what I used to call clackers. And the whole turning point mechanic was based on this game that um, my father played when he drank and gambled, where you would you would roll dice and, and you were trying to get every number rolled on a six sided die um, first. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to incorporate that into the game mechanics yeah. because I, I kind of like that, you know, waiting for it. And, and that's where the whole turning point idea came from. And when we experimented with making the clackers, it was kind of it was kind of expensive to do them. And then, you know, we, we had already been um, toying around with the concept of the frame. So we decided to put the turning point counters into the frame on the board. Um, and then that frame also counted off the grid. It had the numbering system for the, for the board grid on Mm -hmm. there for placing the hazards and things like that. Um, after we took another look at everything, we started looking at, you know, what a big cost that frame was in the original version and how it didn't really do a lot. And we, we were looking at some of the limitations that it posed us because we were trying to build the game around the frame. So we made it, 
just a one v one game, and 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 it was making it hard to make it a, a three or a four player game. And we started breaking everything down and really thinking about the the game itself and detaching it from the components that we already had. Mm-hmm. And we were like, okay, you know, do we want to keep this frame? And if we're going to keep this frame, what's what's going to be the purpose of the frame? Um, the original version had sheets, had basic, basically character sheets for the um, helots. And the pen and paper thing was kind of cool, but we, we wanted to do more with the coins that we had created. And we decided, like, okay, we're going to start keeping track of the health with these coins. And then that way we can pass them, you know, back and forth um, as we're doing damage which turned into this credit system, which turned into the, the crowd pile. Um, and then we started looking at the frame. Okay, now we're going to make the frame the same on all four sides, which made it incredibly cheaper to manufacture because instead of these big pieces of plastic that each one was unique, we now had all four sides were the same. Mm-hmm. And they were a lot more functional. Um, now the problem was, okay, how do we, how do we fit this into a box? And that's where the magnets came into play. Um, that's where, you know, we started looking at the frame and saying, okay, we can, we can break this thing apart into sections. And this way people don't even necessarily have to use it as a frame around the board. They can use it just as component help holders. They can bring it away from the board mm-hmm. and, you know, put it near them. It gave everybody a lot more flexibility. It made it cheaper to manufacture, manufacture, um, we did a lot more with it um, as as opposed to something that made it look cool. It has a lot more function in the game. Um, It houses the trait counters. Now it holds all your uh, status tokens. It tracks your hell. It's health. It still tracks the turning points. And it also um, keeps track of your initiative die roll. So everybody knows the uh, initiative order throughout the, throughout the game. Because that changes round around. We don't have a static initiative. We don't have, okay, I won initiative, and now I'm going to go first until the, the battle's over. You roll for initiative each round. Mm-hmm. And speak now, speaking of the... Um, ah, spe- speaking, uh, speaking of the uh, helots. Now, when I look on the page, I see that you've got four... Exa- examples the supremacist the famished the zealot and the hoarder are those going to be the primary types or do you have more that are going to be in the box so um this again this this version of the game that we're bringing to kickstarter is a toned down version from the last in that we the last time we were we were very unflexible we were like this is the game that we want to bring it needs to have everything in it this this is our masterpiece and it's very expensive <laughs> you know just deal with it we're not we're not going to compromise on anything mm-hmm. and that was arrogant and and very unpopular i mean some people enjoyed it some people you know liked the the passion and and that we we didn't want to compromise but you know we didn't put any real thought into making it affordable it was just you know we're going to make this thing and you're gonna you're gonna like it or you're not. This time we started looking at okay, what what is a version of this game that we can get out that represents everything that we're trying to do that that's fun and has all the elements to it. Like wh- what are the core components of this, and then what are the things that just make it cooler? Mm-hmm. And we made our very base box. And, and our and our goal for the entire campaign, this version that we felt comfortable that if you walked into a store and you saw the game and you read the back of a box and you were like, hey, this is pretty cool, and you brought it home, it would deliver on all the things that you were excited about. And the stuff that just made it even cooler, um, we, we've made that stretch goals. So... What, what it allowed us to do is it made our funding target, the original funding target was 100000 for the first game. And we were able to cut our funding target in half with this version um, because we did things like optimize the board and cut it down to just 
you know, four helots in that base pledge because you're going to have, you know, four players in the game. So let's make sure everybody has a unique helot, you know, when they play the game and um, do all the cards and do all the other things, you know, that we want and, and, and get this thing all bundled up nicely. Now, what we've also done is we've priced out including the other four helots, which would be the, the People's Champion, the Criticure, the Sadist, and um, the, um, gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blank on it right now. <laughs> the People's Champion, the Criticure, the Sadist, and I'm going to scroll down and look at my silhouette so it can jog my memory here. Sorry. Um, oh, the Bloodthirster. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to put all of that in this base pledge as well. But it's going to, you know, it's going to involve more mold costs to make the minis. It's going to involve uh, getting a little discount by increase, increasing the volume that we're going to order to kind of make it all possible to put all this in, in the base box. So there are more helots. There's twice as many, many helots that we want to throw in this thing, but that's all going to come at a higher funding level. So if, um, if we hit our, you know, $50,000 ish goal, we're going to be fine. Everybody's going to get a great board game and a great experience. Um, if, if we do better than that, then we're going to have the option of putting more things into the box to make it even cooler. All right, I got I I can definitely get that now. When it, now um. When it comes to the when it comes to the first part of it of picking a Lanista, um. How, how much how much of a determining factor is that going to be through its trinity of um command influence and deception. So it's it's really going to affect more than anything your your play style. We we tr we tried to balance those those three things. Your your command is kind of free for all command points that you're going to be able to use throughout the bout. Mm -hmm. So um, command can be spent, like I said, either either on movement or on actions. And you're going to have a, a ratio die, which is going to depend, which is going to determine the ratio of those. Uh, points. So you always get six command points, um, and then you roll that d6, and that tells you um, the ratio of how you got to spend them. So let's say I rolled a two. I'm going to either have to spend two on actions and four on movement, or two on movement and four on actions. That's the decision that I get to make. And those command points um, will let you add to that. So Let's say I really want to do four movement because it'll allow me to get behind my opponent's helot if I do that. So I'd use two command points and the two uh, movement points that I rolled, and then I'd spend four points on um, actions, you know, attacking the, the helot from behind. Deception, what that does is it, it, is it allows you to decide for your opponent how they're going to spend that ratio. So if I use a deception, then I can insist that my opponent uses um, four on movement and two on action. And then my, my opponent has to you know, make decisions as to what to do with this helot base, based on that. Um, that comes in handy a lot when somebody rolls a six, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so... The third is your influence. Now, your influence is how many influence cards you get to keep at the beginning of the bout. So at the beginning of the bout, all the, all the Lannistas, all the players get dealt six influence cards. Mm -hmm. And you can only keep the amount of influence uh, cards that your Lannista's influence has. So if I have a Lannister with two influence, I get to keep two out of those six cards. I have to dis discard the rest of those cards. And what we did is we went through and we kind of balanced those three things uh, between um, all the different starting Lannistas for the for the game. Mm -hmm. So you can pick your Lannistas, you can you know select them at random, 
you know, once you buy a game, you can monopoly rule the shit out of it and, and do whatever you want. You can say, hey, look, I just like everybody to get two deception, two command, and, and two influence. So, um, but these were, you know, just fun variety combinations that we put together that will kind of affect your strategy uh, more so than your ability to win. Yeah. Now, when it given given that given the fact that the way the way you describe it, it sounds like um, the choice of Lenista will can will kind of be a tell as far as what sort of play style can be um, reasonably expected. I.e., what what tactics you're going to favor or disfavor. Um, with, Possibly, it, it doesn't have a huge it doesn't have a huge swing. Uh, I I guess the I guess the I guess the uh, better way to put it would be it's going to be where you're going to be um leaning. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's just it's things to watch out for. So, you know, if I I see what my opponent has in their arsenal, I have to keep that in mind when I'm navigating my my helmet, you know. I I got to remember like okay, he does have a deception over there, so you know, I need to I need to be wary of that. Yeah. Now when it comes to when it comes to um, helots, um, I, I see that they ha that they have trait bonuses, unique trait feature, and um, I believe the last one is a special motivation. Um, how is how is that how is that going to work for individual helots? Okay, so the the motivations um, determine. Uh, what their specialty uh, trait is. So, so each motivation has something um, that they that they can do unique to all the other helots. Mm -hmm. So, um, when when you play your your individual motivations, they're all going to have like a, a little unique special ability to distinguish them. They're also going to have different trait bonuses. So you're going to have trait counters uh, for your helot. And as you're rolling your initiative rolls, you're going to be increasing these trait counters along the way. And you can spend your traits on different special moves and abilities. So the trait bonuses that each motivation will have will just be starting bonuses to the trait. So each one will have uh, one trait with that, that they'll start with one on their trait counter with. Um, your trait abilities are going to be special moves that you spend these trait bonuses on. So you have trait abilities that everyone has access to, and then you have certain trait abilities that only your particular motivation will have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the zealot can perform a blood ritual, which basically means if a, if, a, if a zealot's lost a, a limb during the fight, if it can find a blood puddle to stand in and it has the um, trait bonuses available or, or uh, the trait counter available to it, it can restore that limb with one uh, hit point to it, which will negate the SDS uh, bonuses that or SDS deficits that that it experiences to uh to strike yeah um and to to now when it comes to setting up the barge i.e well i.e welcome to hell um yeah <laughs> the first thing that i was curious now with some of the hazards i th i think i can get a good grasp on how it's going to be um pillars are good for pillars and spikes are self-explanatory same with the floor saws um, mm -hmm. Definitely emphasizing um, spatial control, but mm -hmm. what? But um, what would be the significance of blood and guts? Okay, so blood and guts are going to um, be placed before the bout, and then they're also going to get going to occur during the bout. So blood is going to when you walk into a blood puddle your helot is going to slide. You're going to, you're going to use a directional die to determine what square your helot is going to be placed in. Um, so if, if I step into a blood puddle and I roll north, then my, my helot's going to slide one square to the north, and that'll be its new position. 
if I roll, let's say, west, and there happens to be a pillar there to the west, then he can kind of grab that pillar and actually stay and remain in that in that square. Um, but let's say I roll east and there happens to be floor spikes to the east. Well, that, that hell, it's now going into those floor spikes. So blood is just that. It's just, it's a, it's a slippery puddle of blood that's going to slip slide your helot when your helot walks through it. Guts, on the other hand, um, are just going to cost an extra movement to get out of or do anything in. So if you walk into a guts tile, um, you're going to have to spend an extra movement point to get out of the guts tile, or you'll have to spend an extra movement point to rotate within that guts tile. Mm -hmm. Now, how they occur in the in during the bouts is when somebody loses a limb, you lay down a uh, blood tile in that space, and when somebody loses their uh, helot, when a helot's killed in the arena, then you replace that helot with a guts tile. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to weapons, I would get uh, given my background with um with arena shooters, I'm guessing that those would be what would be referred to as power positions. So there's, there's the way we, the way we structure the weapons there. Um, they have a use counter on them. Mm -hmm. They either have ammo or they have durability. So um, they're going to give you an advantage and they usually give you a disadvantage as well. And you can use them a limited number of times throughout the bout. Um, so we, we have ranged weapons. Uh, we have things like uh, uh, bolas and uh, nets. We have um, uh, one-handed weapons, two-handed weapons, and we have like a shiv. Mm -hmm. And what they'll do is um, some, some give you a damage bonus. Some will kind of give you incentive to like get behind your opponent. Some will give you defensive bonuses. They'll allow you to protect a body location that may be weak during the fight. Um, we try not to make it. None of the weapons are going to make you dominate your opponent, um, but they but they definitely give you an advantage, and it makes it, it makes it worthwhile to try and bust open the crates to see what's in there. Yep. Now, with now, when it comes to influence, I'm get I'm guessing that's just the means of um, customizing before a, a, a bit of um, pre-match customization. I give I giving they're, they're instant. They're they're usually instant plays. Mm -hmm. So your influence cards are instant plays that'll do things like um, stand your helot up from a prone position or keep your opponent's helot from uh, moving. Uh, we've got one called "I'm Rubber, You're Glue." which um, for this attack, and it's before the attacks are rolled, uh, basically any damage that's supposed to be done to your helot is, is going to be done to the opponent instead. Mm -hmm. um, they're just little, they're little quick, like, I gotcha. You know, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trick you. I bribed the barge captain, and he told me I could turn the floor saws on whenever I want, and I'm turning them on right now because you look like you're standing right in front of one. Um, just different, different things like that to kind of increase the theme of, you know, cheating and, you know, you'll do anything to win and, um, also just give you, you know, give you some strategy and, uh, and duress mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when you're playing. Of course, I couldn't help but chuckle at the fact that the example influence card that's shown is called, I drink your milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when it when now when it come now when it comes to when it comes to the important now you've already mentioned about the whole the whole notion of um of cred coins, but when it comes to the raw, when it comes to the raw stats of an of an individual um indivi of individual monsters during attacks, mm -hmm. would it be would it be fair to say that it's mostly um that it's mo that like like the raw stats are mostly die based, i.e. No, it isn't a case of 
die plus a static modifier. It's straight up rolling dice. Yeah, you're you're straight up you're straight up rolling dice. The motivation stats increase those um, trait counters, and those trait counters can just be spent on different unique um, ability abilities throughout the throughout the bout, mm -hmm. and it, it's everything's pretty everything's pretty random. Um, th there's no real way to decide your strategy before you start the bout. You really kind of have to roll with what you're giving, what you're given as you go. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're not going to have any kind of perfect build. Um, you're, you're just going to have to get good at reading situations and um, making things work to your advantage. Um, that, that's really the way we, we kind of designed it. And there's, there's, there's a lot going on when, when you're playing a, a Nexus bout, there's a lot to kind of keep track of. Um, it, it's almost like a, um, it's almost like a, a, a battle tech kind of, uh, game, but without the without the pen and paper it's a it's a little bit more board gamey <laughs> version of battletech I, mm -hmm. I guess we we really have never played anything quite like it. it it's a very original thing you know we we have we definitely have a lot of influences in it but it's hard to it's hard to describe how it how it goes down but no there's no there's no static modifier sometimes you'll get a damage bonus and uh, you get what uh, what we call SDS bonuses, which increases the amount of dice you roll, mm -hmm. but you're only using two at any given time. So if, if I'm plus SDS, that means I'm going to roll three dice six, and I'm going to keep the top two values. If I'm plus two SDS, I'm going to roll four dice six, but I'm still just going to keep those top two values. If I'm negative SDS, it's the reverse of that. I'm going to roll three die six, and I'm going to keep the lowest two values. Mm -hmm. um, and what that sets up is a situation where you have very clear bonuses and disadvantages, and, and they're big bonuses, and they're big different disadvantages in the SDS system. But theoretically, everybody has the same chance or everybody has a chance to roll the same range. You're going to roll between a, a one and a, or a two and a 12, mm -hmm. you know, your minimum and your maximum, no matter how low the odds may be of you rolling it are always the same. So you always have the opportunity to perform like a Rocky type moment. And it's happened, you know, in, in play testing quite a bit where somebody's like plus two SDS and they're attacking somebody who's negative one SDS and they roll, you know, three sixes, <laughs> they, they, ro they roll a 12, you know, and you know, it doesn't matter how great the advantage is that the, uh, that the, um, uh, that the attacker has, you know, that, that attacks being defended and it's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's swinging. We, we like that. Some people don't. So some mm -hmm. people that drive them crazy, they want, you know, they, they want the strategy. And, and if I've put myself in this position, I have to be able to, you know, if I can outthink you, I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. And we're like, no, no, sometimes people get lucky. <laughs> and that's fun for us. That that's fun. We, we like dice checking. We like that. We like random numbers. Yeah. Now when it Something that something that I did notice when go when going through the um, when going through the rules my for re, for research for this is the fact that even when even when it comes to um, the pool of actions that you have there isn't there isn't a straightforward attack or de, or defense in or even gra even grapple in the group you always have some degree of options. Mm hmm. Yeah, so you have to decide when, when you're playing, do you want, in, in a lot of it's situational, mm -hmm. um, do you want to do a wild flailing attack that isn't going to do much damage, but you can do a bunch of them? That's an option. You can just do wild attacks. You can just flail at your opponent, and all you're going to do is overall damage to them, um, but you can do a bunch of them. 
you know, you, you can you can just flurry, tell your helot to just flurry away at his opponent. Mm -hmm. um, and that costs only one action point. So the other option you have is, is just your a standard attack, is, is what we call it, and that costs two action points. And this is a this is a real focused attack that'll actually do location damage to your opponent, but but that location damage is gonna be random. Um, so you're going to roll a D six if you're successful and you're going to see which location you actually hit. Now, the other thing you can do is you can tell your helot to perform a focused attack. And that means, you know, you have a very specific spot that you want your helot to attack. And that's three action points because of the level of concentration involved in it. And it's a, it's, it's negative SDS to accomplish it because again, you're trying to perform a more difficult action so depending on what's going on in the fight um all those things are viable options um and it, and it really just kind of comes down to your play style or, or what situation you're in or, or what you feel like doing um you know some people will never do a focused attack because they don't like that disadvantage or they'll do it only if they have if they're behind an opponent or something like that yeah. but if if your helot is you know um, facing an opponent that, that only has one or two hit points left in a limb, and you know by taking that limb out that hell it's going to be at a disadvantage for the rest of the fight, well, you might change your <laughs> you might change your way of thinking about whether or not you want to perform a focused attack so you can take that limb out. Um, and, and again, we try to give people choices and strategy um, in abundance so people can experiment with different fight styles and different play styles and and have um different things that make sense in different situations mm -hmm. um something that i do find interesting when it comes to how these this particular sandbox is set up is i get the feeling that the people who are going to have the shortest shelf life are the people who just try and go for um straightforward full frontal assaults mm-hmm yeah, I mean it's <laughs> it's it's hard to do that it, with with the way the ratio with the ratio the way the ratio die works and and how it forces you to break up your command points. Mm -hmm. It it forces a lot of movement and it forces you to do it forces you to play the game as opposed to just I'm going to line up in front of you, you're going to line up in front of me and we're going to swing at each other until one of us is dead. Um it forces you not to do that. The the hazards force you to not do that. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that just come up on the fly. The, the whole game is just, holy shit, something crazy just happens that, that I need to deal with in addition to trying to, you know, have my helot kill its opponent. Now, one of the other things I find interesting is the SDS, the sliding die scale. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious um, how that how that exactly came about because you effectively have a case of most of the time when you're rolling, you're rolling two d six and you're hoping for the best. And mm -hmm. with the way it um, slides, whether it go whether it goes negatively or positively determines um, what you're keeping and what you're dropping. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm cu I'm curious how that came about. If that was a solution to a problem that you had in development, or was there a different route? Um, it was the the original version of the sliding dice scale was multiple dice because we loved polyhedrals, um, and and we made the base a d12 because it's my absolute favorite die to roll. I think it's the greatest die ever invented and um i've always wanted to base an entire game around it <laughs> but um but so that that was our that was our standard because it was the most fun to roll and then you would move up and down from like a d12 to to like a d10 and and then some of it would it was weird it was like a d4 plus a d6 and we had like this whole really convoluted sliding dice scale and it was too much. It was too much to keep track of. It, it was, 
it was too much um, when we were doing play testing and people were playing the game. They got it eventually. It, I mean, it wasn't overly complicated, but you spent a lot of time thinking about it and which dice am I grabbing? Okay, what, what is this? What's the base? Because we had the standard would change for certain things. So for some of them, the standard was 10. And um, it's like, okay, well, now I got to go up from the 10 to the 12. Is that an 8 and a 4? Or, is, or do I get to just roll the 12, D12 now? Um, what we ended up doing is is we simplified it and we, we made it D6 based. And we used, um, I guess, if anything, it was influenced by risk. Um, where if you if you have three armies and you're attacking somebody with two armies, <laughs> I think you get the, the extra die mm -hmm. to roll. It's been a minute since I played Risk, but I'm pretty sure that's how it worked. And we kind of we kind of used that. We were trying to simplify the amount of dice. We were trying to simplify what you had to think about and get rid of a reference card, you know, that you had to look at to 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 play the game. We, we did it to streamline it and. What it did is it it made SDS a lot more um, a lot more powerful. So we had to look at we had to reevaluate. Okay, when does something get an SDS bonus? When does something get an SDS disadvantage? Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of tightened things up that way as well. Yeah. Um, now, to be fair, using multiple die types that's something I can see working in a role playing game. Not so much in a board game. Right. And we we kind of had to learn that as we went because we were very role playing game esque. We mm -hmm. we were we were a lot more role playing game than board game in the original version of Nexus. We we leaned way heavier on the role play side than we did the board game side. Mm -hmm. This this is this is more of a board game experience much more of a board game experience. Now, when it comes now um would it be f when it comes to the states and of course I do I do see that um each of them is pretty is pretty um well marked with with their uh, primary letter. But right. would it would it be fair to say that a good chunk of a good chunk of those states are aside from grappled can be inflicted based on the and based on the barge hazards. Like I can see flaming being caused by the brazier. Um, I can mm -hmm. see bleeding caused by the uh, caused by the uh, saws, um, mm -hmm. armed through the crates and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of those are are caused through the um, through the hazards, mm -hmm. but um, things like prone. You know, prone is, that's going to be caused through general attacking. It might be caused through hazards. It might be caused through cards or special um, special moves. Um, grappled, obviously, is in support of the grappled attack actions. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to grapple an opponent before you can perform any of those actions. So when an opponent's grappled, they have that status indicator there. So everybody knows that they're grappled. Um, it also prevents them from doing anything until they liberate themselves uh, during their own turn. Yeah. Uh, armed is you can uh, draw or store stow a weapon throughout the the battle. So um, each weapon has its own cost to holster or sheath um, and draw. So if you have like a big two handed sword, that's going to cost more action points to sheath or, or draw than if you were to have a shiv, for example. Um, and different weapons, when, when you're armed with them, limit the attacks and things that you can do. So um, it's important to know whether or not a, a helot is currently armed or whether or not that weapon is sheathed. Mm -hmm. And at any point, um, uh, you can tell your helot to just drop the weapon, and that doesn't cost any action points. So if you're in a situation where um, you need to let go of the sword because you're about to grapple somebody, then you can just do that. And then that weapon is just uh, discarded from the from the game. Although when it comes to the weapons, looking at the looking at the way they're described, would it be fair to say that it's not something that you can rely on, but more of an ace in the hole given the durability rule? 
Yeah, yeah. And and that was that was the thing is we wanted you to have an advantage. We wanted you to have a reason to pick up the weapon and hold on to the weapon. But we didn't want to make it where if somebody's helot had a weapon and the other helot didn't have a weapon, then, you know, everything was just, okay, well, this is all predetermined. It's over now. Mm-hmm. Fair and balanced, just like Fox News. <laughs> um. <laughs> And of course, of course, of course, having having some the other th- that brings me to the other thing I, w- I was a bit concerned about, which is um, it would be very, very easy for ranged weapons to dominate in, in a game like this. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that's that's partially the reason why there's only one ranged weapon types, whereas the majority of the other. Well, let, I tell a lie. There's only one straightforward ranged weapon types obviously right. nets and bullets are going to count as ranged weapons but right in terms of some some sort damage. of fire armor Something or the like that that's that damage yeah 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 and they're they're um they're difficult to use you have to be in in optimal range to use a ranged weapon so mm-hmm. each ranged weapon has a, a square distance that that it's the sweet spot and if you get closer or further from that distance then you start going down in SDS and ranged weapons um, become very difficult to use uh, be, because of that. Um, so they're they're very cool and and if you're lucky enough to land a hit with one, they they do a fair amount of damage, but they're they're definitely not something that is going to turn uh, turn the tide of the fight just because somebody has it. And give, now, given the given the fact that we're dealing with square bases, mm-hmm. I do have to ask. An, I do have to ask a question that is fairly ob, that is fairly obvious in hindsight, but it is what it is. Uh-huh. Am I going to have to deal with some five ten rule bullshit when it comes to diagonals? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it. It it's nothing. It's nothing against you. Spe- it's nothing against this game specifically. It's just that whenever it comes to grid based combat over the years, um, mm-hmm. some games have a very um, tepid attitude when it comes to diagonal move, diagonal movement, and diagonal aiming. They desperately want to keep everything on the good old WASD. If you'll excuse right. me for making a bit of a shooter joke. Yeah. Um, no. Hey. Glorious PC Master Race. <laughs> um, but it's but I, I get the feeling that in your in this game's case, especially given the the um, claustrophobic nature to an extent mm-hmm. of the barge, mm-hmm. you're you're not you um you have to have diagonal movements count as um no, normal mo- normal movements, and the yeah. same goes for aiming. Otherwise, things get um, yeah, no, absolutely. So you have um, diagonal movement. You can move um, in in any of the three forward squares um, for the exact same uh, value. Mm-hmm. It costs one movement point to move in any of the three forward squares, um, and you do have to spend movement points to rotate your character uh, ninety degrees mm-hmm. and um, strafing. Um, you know, moving left to right or or right to left without changing your forward facing direction, that costs you two movement points. And if you want to back up um, without changing your forward facing direction, you can do that for two movement points as well. Now, when it comes to strafing and backing up, what was the reasoning for why those would be more expensive? Um, Because it, it takes a certain amount of concentration to um do it and it also keeps the it keeps the movement interesting and not um it, it keeps it, it keeps the game interesting mm-hmm. it, 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 it keeps were the flow there, were there some early were there some early tests where um oh, yeah. encounters let encounters ended up being chases because people could just keep running away yeah, because I mean, if you hit somebody and then you back up, you know, you're just going to do that every time. It's you know, like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you and then I'm I'm gonna get as far away from you as possible while you know still facing you. So you can't 
you know, I mean, that that's just kind of um, the, that would be like the best combat strategy that you, that you could have. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to trying to get behind somebody, because you, you get a, an SDS bonus for being behind uh, the opponent when, when your hell it's attacking it, um, being able to just move left or, or right without changing your forward facing direction um, makes that, makes that much easier mm -hmm. to accomplish. Now, given, given that approach and given the fact that it's, it's very, it's very apparent that to me that um, territory control is paramount within this game. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that there are certain attacks or the like that could inflict knockback? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got things that'll, that, that can inflict knockback. You've got, um, things like the against the wall bonus, mm -hmm. um, where if you find yourself being attacked and you're directly between the the opponent attacking you and there's and there's a wall behind you that does extra damage because you can't kind of like go with the punch at all. Um, so that that's an important thing to watch out for. That positioning mm -hmm. is is important during the game. Um, you also have. Uh, the behind the behind the back or the you know getting behind your opponent that that, that position is very important you're you know look, looking at the 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 way the hazards are laid out the the blood tiles the guts tiles there's there's so many things going on in any given moment that you have to think about um it's you know, for, for us, it's exciting. For some people, it's too complicated. For, for some people, it's just, it, it, it can be, it can be too much. They want something that's a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this game is definitely not for everybody. Um, but, but for the people that, for the people that get it and for the people that enjoy um, this, this level of, um, I guess, I, I don't want to say complexity, but this level of detail to, to their engagement it's it's RPG esque, you know. It it's it's a board game, but you know we've we've got some RPG kind of DNA weaved weaved throughout it. A little bit of war gaming DNA weaved throughout it. Mm -hmm. And when it when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to that, um, would it be? Like looking o looking over looking over some of the um, some of the hel some of the helots. Um, when it comes to when it comes to um, when it comes to tra when it comes to traits um, mm -hmm. and the and the whole notion of um, trait of trait reserve. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever there's a limited resource for for extra abilities, there's always I always find that there's a temptation among players to use to be very conservative with that resource. The whole mm -hmm. rainy day problem. Um, mm -hmm. Has that been something that's that's come that's come across through playtesting, and how how do you uh, try and minimize that? So when we when we selected what. Um, what levels you get things at. So for each each trait, and this is just the straight up trait spending. Mm -hmm. This isn't even getting into the individual motivation um, special ability traits because most of those are a combination of traits. It'll be like two swagger and two physicality and one deafness to perform something. Um, for the straight up traits, um, you, you're, it's going to start at three. There, there's, there's an action at, at a three spend, a four spend, and it maxes out at a five spend. Mm -hmm. So once you get to five, you can't, you can't gain any more in that trade until you lose it. Okay. Or until you use it, I should say. Um, so even if somebody does want to stockpile, they can only go as high as five and, th and then it doesn't matter. It's not like the, it can just go infinitely. And what we did is we tried to design it where three was pretty cool and something useful if the right situation comes up. Four is something pretty, pretty neat. 
And mm -hmm. five is something that, given the right si situation, it might be amazing to have that available. But who knows if that's actually going to happen? Okay. And we wanted people constantly struggling with, you know, do I want to hold on to it? Am I saving for a rainy day? And different things happen. So a lot of the turning point cards will bring the, the trait pools into play where something will happen. Um, there's a there's a sniper in the crowd and he's decided he's going to kill a, a helot today. And he's, you know, locked in on your helot's head. Your helot's going to take five damage to its head. Unless you want to spend uh, one deafness for each point of damage that your hell it's able to avoid. And, you know, so, so there's different, there's different things that are going to come into play during turning points. There's going to be different situations where you're going to go, Oh, no, wait, I'm going to use my traits to, you know, cancel out this, this effect mm -hmm. um, to where, yeah, you may want to save it for a rainy day, but are you really going to have that opportunity? Um, are you going to do it and it's going to be a complete waste because that situation just never even comes into play? Um, you know, it's, it's up to you again. It's, it's up to that, that player's play style. I, I like it. You know, I like it when I watch someone trying to save for a rainy day because, you know, I'm just giggling to myself, especially when they keep rolling the same trait and, you know, they're, they're basically wasting it because they haven't used it. Yeah. And when it comes now, when it comes to turn, when it comes to um, turning point, would it be fair to say that the turning point mechanic is a kind of equivalent to momentum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big swing. It's a big swing. When when you hit your turning point, um, a lot of things happen. Some some of the hazards are triggered by turning points. For example, the floor spikes will all change locations on a turning point. So you have to roll your your uh, your position dice to um, to move all the floor spikes. Um, the person that, the, the Lannister that got the turning point, their helot now has a plus six damage bonus to their next successful attack. So their next hit is, is going to be devastating. Um, and, and everybody knows it. Um, the other thing that happens is, is you have the turning point cards and, and those can go for or against the person who rolled the turning point and they can affect the, the Lannisters themselves. Mm -hmm. They can affect the helots. They can affect the, um, the crowd pile. They, they can affect really anything. The turning points are just that they can, they can swing the momentum of the fight completely. And, depending on what's happening in the fight, um, everything kind of builds up to that. Uh, most of the hazards run on what we call turning point duplicates. So as you're getting more, as you're filling up that counter, um, the more coins you have in there, the more turning point duplicates you're going to start rolling. So um, let's say I've got the one, two, three, four slot already filled up. And the only empty slots I have are the five and six. Well, every time I, ro I roll a one, two, three, or four, if there's floor saws as a part of this bout, a new floor saw spawns. So the, the more of those coins that get filled up, you get to the point where there's a floor saw spawning every single action round and ripping across the arena floor. And when you first start playing Nexus with the floor saws, you're like, oh, well, that, that's not too bad. It doesn't seem like they're really going to hit anything. Mm -hmm. But... You know, when you've got two players that have five of the coin slots filled up and, and every time before they can do anything else, you got to see where this floor saw is going to rip across the arena. Things start getting really hairy really quick and, and everything just kind of builds towards this, you know, momentum of the turning point um, to where somebody finally rolls it. They draw the turning point card. They, you know, they hit the other helot and they finally spend those, you know, six coins on damage. And then everything kind of settles down again. But but at that point, you know, the fight's leaning heavily one way or the other. And when it when now um when I was looking at the um up when I was looking at the upgrades, um 
I do have to I do have to ask about the about the plastic board because it's described it, as beer proof design. Was yeah. that it was that speaking from experience? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. We when when we sat down to make Nexus, and this goes back to that first version mm -hmm. where we were like, this is the version we want, and this is what everybody needs to have. We wanted to make a a, a board game for adults that um was durable that you, you didn't have to worry about. We, we didn't want people worrying about the components. We wanted people to be able to just cut up and have fun. And, and we envisioned people playing Nexus in a group where um, the legacy version has like betting mechanics in it. So even if you don't have a, uh, even if you're not actually sitting there playing, you can actually wager and bet on the arena bout so you can still be increasing your your fame and legacy as you know or, or your pocketbooks as as fights are going that you're not related to because mm -hmm. we just envision people sitting and you know playing nexus and and guys are going at it and there's other guys just kind of having a conversation and checking in every so often to see how the guy they you know they bet on was doing um we we wanted the miniatures to be you know sizable so if you weren't um, if you weren't a miniature painter, if you were new in the hobby, you don't have a, an entire army of, of little tiny things to try and manic, man, you know, meticulously paint. You have one big beefy miniature that's well sculpted that you can do some basic painting techniques and simple washes and, and the detail of the sculpt is going to make it look really cool. And you can take that guy and you can go and you can, you can play some Nexus. Mm -hmm. Um, all of that was kind of part of the design and and the beer proof thing was definitely part of the design the, the very first thing that jay and i talked about is you know can can we get a, a board that isn't cardboard like can can we make a board that's that's plastic and durable and looks as cool as the minis that you're putting on it um and it took you know it, it took some research on our part to come up with a with the system in a way to a way to do it but we kind of we finally figured it out and it it's awesome like we we absolutely yeah, love I'm, this board. i'm just i'm just picturing i'm just picturing you guys have you guys finally getting the prototype and some and somebody goes okay time for the acid test and just pour and just pour yeah. beer on the thing yep yeah Which we did that we, took, we tried to we tried to scrape the um the imprint off of it mm -hmm. Um, we were taking the coins and just like like it was a lottery ticket, <laughs> and we were just scratching all over that thing, just trying to do damage to it. Um, throwing it across the room, we took it out in the parking lot and uh, did like a, the the scene in office space with the printer. Um, we we put it through the 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 full spectrum, and the thing the thing held up, mm -hmm. and it has had many beers dumped on it. And the on one on one hand, I can, on one hand I can appreciate that given the um, given the infamous Jesus story with the with a um, Game Boy Advance all those years ago that got te that got tested, um, including seeing if it was going to last, um, getting it flushed down the toilet. Right, right. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I should be shaming you for wasting good beer. I'm hoping yeah, it was Budweiser, yeah. in which case your sins are forgiven. Well, no, I said it's beer. Yeah, so <laughs> you can take Budweiser like right out of the equation, right? Yeah. right away. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I th if I think you that. look, if you look, do you see the grooves on the board? Mm -hmm. Okay, no beer was wasted. Okay, it all pulls up right in the grooves. You can tip it, and you can pour it right back into the into the glass or bottle or whatever you're drinking out of. Oh, well, that's convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not only is it beer proof, but it'll keep you from wasting the beer. It can still be drank even after it's on the board. Might be a bit nasty to do that, but okay. <laughs> Nexus is a nasty game for nasty people. <laughs> um, there's a small part. There's a small part of me that wa that wonders if you guys were ever reading um, heavy a issues of heavy metal back in the day. Oh well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got like a, uh, I've got a whole collection of ABC Warriors over here. Um, <laughs> we've got, um, yeah. I mean, we 
that that's all right in the wheelhouse of nexus i mean if, if you look on the campaign page there's you know there's a picture of us with guar um they actually came by our our booth to meet targ the carver uh when we were at gen con mm -hmm. um it's i mean nexus is nexus is is jay and i this is what this is what we're into and we realize it's a it's it's not a um it's not a huge crowd <laughs> There's, there's a very specific group of people that are going to um, uh, realize what's going on in this game on, on the onset. But, but the people that discover it are, are extremely passionate about it. And, you know, we take, we take a lot of pride in that. We could have made, um, I mean, the other day I saw polyhedral dice ice cube trays. And it made like, you know... I don't know, some ridiculous amount of money on Kickstarter. And I was just like, God, why didn't we just do that? Why didn't, why don't we just take, you know, nerd culture and, and make a fucking scrunchie or some shit and, and just collect money. Why do we have to be all like passionate about <laughs> something and dump our hearts into something that like a very niche group is, is actually going to appreciate and get, but I don't know. That's, that's what, that's what we are. That's what we have mm -hmm. to do. We can't, we can't have it any other way, obviously. Yeah, and to be f to be fair, to be fair, I could probably do something sip. I could probably do something similar if I only if I if I stuck to just covering um, vanilla D and D like everybody else. But I can't. Right. But I can't do that either. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's just there's just something you know. There's people out there that that are happy doing that, and you know. That's that's great, but we didn't want to bring just like another game to Kickstarter that's been like reskinned a hundred thousand times that everyone's familiar with, and they're like, "Oh, I know exactly what I'm getting because I've got 27 copies of it." This is just like a different genre. This is a different, you know, IP that just went into public domain mm -hmm. that they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna make a version of. I mean. Cthulhu is great, but fuck me, man. I, th I think we got enough. Like, <laughs> I realize it's in public to domain now. You know, it's yeah, it it is what it is. It's just it is what, what we what chose is. to do, <laughs> and that t that tends to be how that tends to be how this kind of thing ends up working at the at the end of the day. A lot of people who are do who are going off the path are doing it because they they want to do it, not to um. Not to not to try and get not to try and get their buzz up or some or some crap like that. Um, right, right. But with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come back up and brave the mists of time of time zones to head up to the temple. Yeah, man, it's it's absolutely my pleasure. Mm -hmm. I I love. I love talking about our stuff. Um, any opportunity we get to do it, you always um, you always ask really really good questions, and you get me thinking about things, and um, uh, I, I enjoy it. So thank you, thank you for having me. My pleasure. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>